Yeah. All right, we're going to get started. If you have, uh, I sent out the lyrics this morning in an email, you can put this up and follow along. We'll uh, start with our call. Uh, Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us to be joined together in the unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Just stay in the same. <laughs> Jesus' blood in the righteous man. I dare not trust the sweetest praise, but holy trust in Jesus' name. that again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. Trust the sweetest prey, but holy trust in Jesus. Christ of all, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, through the storm, he is Lord, darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds a gale. As we experience this um, uh, in our world, in our country, in our state, in our city, as we experience the various uh, storms that surround us in this life that's so chaotic, um, uh, 
and unstable. But remember that Christ is the Lord and that and we are your church and we gather to proclaim that. And no matter what happens, no matter how uh, good or bad things are, that Jesus is better, that you are the Lord over it all. And so we gather here with all of our anxieties and frustrations and whatever we carry, we lift up our Jesus Christ as Lord. Start in all my sorrows. In all my sorrows, Jesus is better. Make my heart believe in every victory. Jesus is better. Make my heart believe than any comfort. Jesus is better. Make my heart believe more than all riches. Jesus is better. Make my heart believe. Father, we thank you for the chance to gather and worship you, even in the rain, even outside, even with all the limitations. And thank you that you are the Lord. We thank you that you renew us, that you promise to restore us, whether in the sight of death or not. We hold on to your promise, the Christ that corners you. There is no other so short and steady. My hope is held in your hand. When castles crumble and breath is fleeting upon this rock I stand. Upon this rock I stand. Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of God. Than any comfort, 
sing that chorus again. I don't know if that feels true for you or not, uh, that Jesus is better, that we have no other king. He is our sure and true foundation. But we are told stories all the time, and we are people who have come to believe this one, that we have given our lives in pursuit of this one. And if we stop that, there are all sorts of other things that want to compete, that want to take the place of that story. And so we gather and we proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And as we do that, it shapes our hearts to remember his goodness, to remember the promises that we've received, remember how he has changed us. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Our Father, we thank you that you are the kind of God who provides in ways we don't even value or see. We open our hearts to you now, help us to receive you 
as, as much as this ground absorbs this rain, may our hearts be that open to you. And that nourishing to whatever you plant in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so last Sunday we talked about the kingdom and the empire. And um, I had a few folks ask me, so what does it actually look like? Like, I love the description of the empire that you gave. What does it look like to actually live in an empire? Uh, sorry, did I say the empire that you gave? I mean the kingdom that you gave. So they, they loved the description of the kingdom that I gave, but we also live in a world that is not shaped by the kingdom. So how do we live as those dual citizens that I was describing last week? And um, what practical ways? do we have to move forward to live as kingdom citizens while also living in empire? And, then, and that's a really good question, and one that I think we should be asking, and one that Christians have asked throughout the centuries. I think if you weren't here last week as well, it's really important that you know even the word kingdom is viewed through the lens of empire sometimes. That kingdom often brings to mind abusive kings, and feudalism, and oppression, and um, monarchies and all the things that we don't think are healthy and good. And so even our understanding of kingdom will have to be changed in order to receive the king that we know who is not oppressive, who is not violent, who does not use his power to uh, overthrow other um, people but to welcome. And in some ways, the way that he doesn't oppress is a part of what's challenging sometimes to understand this kingdom that we're talking about. So I, as I've been um, just exploring the best passage to bring to you today to describe in more ways what it looks like to live in the kingdom, I've realized how there's really not one passage. That's part of the problem. There's not like a, just a list or a set of, like, this is the exact, that everything is right there in this one passage. So I put up something on Facebook to ask a bunch of people, what helps you learn about and live in the kingdom? And it was a great conversation, but everybody said something different. So... Um, that was actually good because it made me feel better that I couldn't find one passage to bring to you. I think one of the best things we can do to understand the kingdom, of course, is to look at Jesus. Um, and he talked about the kingdom more than anything else. Almost everything he talked about was somehow about what it means to be in God's kingdom. But the weird thing about that is if you just look at his words, he actually is not, if he was describing an animal, he wouldn't be describing its fur color or its height. He would be describing like how to recognize its footprints. He, when he talks about the kingdom, he talks about uh, how it moves and the scale that it functions on. And so it can be a little bit, it seems a bit vague. So one of the best things to do then is to just look at how he lived, how he welcomed all, and how he described the kingdom with his very way of life, in addition to the words that he spoke about it. So to, if we think about kingdom as being a way of life, a way of living and experiencing it, one way that I think would be really helpful to sum that up is to look at the ways that when God was setting up a way of life for people, how he set that up for people. There have been times throughout history that in his engagement with human beings, God has said, here is a way that I want you to live that will help you live as if I'm the king. And so there's different ways throughout history that he's done. And I actually even love the fact that it's looked different at different times and in different places. He understands that the needs of humans have changed over history and change according to circumstances, but the kingdom stays the same. So uh, let's just have a look at a few different ways that God throughout scripture set up a life of kingdom living throughout the whole of the Bible. So first of all, of course, we have the Garden of Eden, a beautiful description of living in harmony with one another, with creation and with God, where there is plenty, where there is welcome, where um, there is beauty, there is diversity, there's male and female, there's many different kinds of animals, and it's, it's beautiful. And at the same time, there are boundaries. God still says, but don't eat from this tree. And so that's, a, a, if you've ever read that story, if you've ever imagined the Garden of Eden, it's the epitome of a wonderful, peaceful life of having enough and living in harmony, which is a beautiful way that God set that up. Of course, human beings messed it up. So in another way, God set up a way of life with him by describing and shaping the nation of Israel, a group of people, an extended family, really, that he then gave a place and gave a way of life, a rhythm of life that was living as if God is king. And of course, they got frustrated with that. They wanted a human king instead. But he shaped a way of life where they, they rested, they trusted in God's provision, they uh, had justice and generosity built into their very structures of their way of life, 
And yet, also there were boundaries. There were things that were not appropriate in this kingdom as well. But again, that had its pitfalls, and people didn't always live in that way. And so God came, the king came himself to live in a way that would show to us what does it look like to live in the kingdom. And so, thankfully, he's the kind of person who can both be the king and the one who's following at the same time. And so Jesus lives in his father's reign. Even though he's functioning in the Roman Empire at a particular time and place, he just wakes up every morning existing in the reality that is shaped by the Father. Every morning he wakes and assumes that, that this is the kingdom of God that is already flourishing, and he makes his decisions. He speaks and acts as if it's true, that he submits his own self every moment to how this would affect every choice that he would make. And as a result, he didn't also resort in domination or in violence to accomplish his purposes. He trusted that ultimately God was the king and God was at work, even if it didn't look like that in the world yet. And he welcomed all, trusting that he could, that they could be uh, find God as king as well. And at the same time, he said, not all will enter the kingdom. And so you can see there are some themes building here throughout all of these ways that God set up a way of life for people. And then, of course, when Jesus leaves the earth in bodily form, he says, the church is going to be my representation on the earth, that this is going to be my body, no longer in one human man, but in the bodies of thousands, millions of people across generations and across places and times. And that my spirit will now dwell in them, and somehow the way that they live, again, not perfectly, we get it wrong all the time, but we are living, our call is to live in a way that Jesus lived. Submitting to the Father's reign all the time, living as if his reign is actually happening, choosing our decisions and our words and our actions to proclaim that kingdom, to live it to one another, and to welcome others into it. Again, there is uh, welcome. Again, there is diversity. Again, there is flourishing. And there is beauty, and there is plenty. And again, there are also boundaries. And again, human beings don't live it fully, but still God's kingdom reigns. And then finally, at the very end of Scripture, in Revelation 7, and then the last two chapters of Revelation, we see this description of this wedding feast and a city as well. But a, again, a gathering of human beings that are living in the same kind of harmony. There's actually a lot of language. It's like bookends with the Garden of Eden and the description in Revelation that are describing some of the same things. A place of flourishing, a place of, of life, and a place where there is water flowing, where there is fruit growing and where everybody has what they need. And it's beautiful in Revelation because it even adds this element that says they won't need the temple anymore. They won't need the sun anymore because God himself will be with them. And they won't have to work so hard to remember that he's the king anymore because he will be there with them. It says God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and uh, God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. But again, not everyone is able to enter into this kingdom as well as Revelation tells it. So I hope that just that really brief overview of some of the descriptions of how God has created a way of living as if he's the king for his people over the centuries gives some sense of the kind of thing that we're talking about with the kingdom, but it still feels kind of vague. I know it's still hard to know, like, well, okay, how do we live as if that's happening? Even if we've been invited to live in the church, even if we've been told this is a gathering of God's people and that we live as if he's king, if we don't always get it right and we still have to function in a world that doesn't live as if God is king, how do we actually get up and live every day as if that's a reality? Well, um, my paper is, like, <laughs> so it's really hard to even read it. Um, I think one of the things that I was frustrated with this week as I was trying to figure this out was actually a part of the answer as well. That if we are trying to understand the kingdom according to the ways of the empire, according to the values that we already have, we're never going to actually find it. And Jesus says this many times. You have to become like children. You have to enter the narrow gate. It's going to actually transform you in order to even understand what the kingdom is. And I was reading this week about uh, wampum, which I know is a word that hasn't been used very kindly over the years, but the concept of wampum with Native American culture is fascinating to me because if you've ever seen it in a museum, it's often a belt that's made out of tiny little beads that are made of shells, this beautiful decorative 
very elaborate belt. And um, oftentimes, it just came to be understood as money to European settlers. And even like in crossword clues and things like that, it's equated with currency or money. But, and I don't know enough to fully understand this. All I know is that that's not really what it is. Um, in some reading I was doing this week, it was saying that um, the, the shell bead um, belt communicated someone's station, their value, and their obligation to their people, as well as the spiritual message conveyed by the design of those shells. So to really actually understand wampum, um, which I think the word is hard for me to say because it has even been used in a way that's abusive, but to even understand the Native American way of understanding that, you would have to live with them, you would have to know their way of life, you would have to come to understand what they value. But a transactional culture is only going to see that as money. And so it's going to totally miss the point. And Native Americans had to come to a place of understanding currency according to the European way of understanding it. But they still had the concept, their own idea of what was truly valuable. And that wasn't a transactional kind of way of thinking about it as the European people had. And so this is just one little example of what it means to, to be able to imagine something that's not currently a part of your way of seeing. That those uh, European settlers weren't able to think, maybe it's something we don't even have a word for yet. We have a word for money, and so we're just going to say that's money. But they would have had to actually expand their own imaginations and their own vocabularies in, in, in order to even be able to understand this other way of doing things. And this is actually what Jesus is inviting us into. And it's actually, I think, a reason why people on the margins, when Jesus was alive and even today, um, or as alive as a human being, and even today, why people on the margins often get the kingdom more than others because they're used to having to expand their own imaginations, to living uh, cross-culturally in their own culture, to living in two realities at once, to having a foot in two different worlds. And so oftentimes the people who have to do that in other ways understand the kingdom and know how to live in the kingdom. And I think oftentimes when Jesus says it's hard for a rich man or a rich person to enter the kingdom, uh, we are actually rich people in the history of the world and across the planet. It's hard for rich people to, to set aside their comfort, to set aside their usual ways of seeing, and to actually expand our imaginations enough to, to live into this kingdom. So to sum it all up, I just will say it this way. How do we then live in this kingdom that is so hard to wrap our minds around, that requires us to be transformed in order to even live in it? Well, just one verse that Jesus says helps me out a lot with this. Matthew 7, 21, where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's possible to call Jesus Lord, but not live as if Jesus is Lord. And so the only way that we actually enter into the kingdom is not by talking about the kingdom and reading about the kingdom or making a diagram of the kingdom, but living as if Jesus is our king, which costs a lot. And I think this helps me understand why the way that Jesus describes it is not actually able to unpack all the details, but he's more talking to people at the beginning stages. Don't be surprised if it looks small, he's saying. Don't be surprised if it feels unimportant at the beginning. Don't be surprised if at some point you get to the place where you might be willing to give up everything for this thing. Those are the parables that he speaks. It's more about how to say yes to the kingdom. How to not be surprised that it feels strange or insignificant or unimportant. And once we say yes in one way to say, oh, how is, the, how is he my king? If every day we, we wake up and say, what does it look like for God to be king? in my life right now? What if he is already reigning in his kingdom and he's inviting me to live as if that's true? If we make our decisions about our work, about our conversations, about the places we go, the people we meet with, the things we read, the songs we sing, the TV we watch, if there is, if that is somehow, if everything we do, if every way we think and live is somehow submitted to God as king, then we can't help but be transformed because that will put us in uncomfortable places on a daily basis. That will make us have to have choices on a regular basis between what this world values and what this king values and who he is. And so here is a strange invitation. Again, it still feels kind of vague, although I think it's actually doable to just say, how is God king? In this moment, in this day, in this time, in this neighborhood, in this life, how do I live as if God is king? And it will strip things away from us. 
And it will also free us to live in a kingdom that is like you just described, where there is plenty, where there is diversity, where there is peace, where there is beauty and abundance, where there is welcome. And so I wish I could tell you something that feels more concrete. All I can tell you is to keep living every day as if he's king. And somehow we'll get it wrong a lot, and we won't express it to others, and we won't learn it ourselves, but we'll also get it right sometimes. And we will live these whole lives being transformed by that choice on a daily basis. And then we'll come to a day where we get to see him face to face. And it won't be so hard to imagine that he is king. And we will see that he is not an oppressive king. And we will see that he has not been forcing himself on us. And we will say he is king and he is Lord without it being such a wrestling match. And he will be the light, the source of everything. He will be our life and our joy. And because we've lived the whole life wanting to submit to that possibility, it will be everything we've ever longed for. And so we submit ourselves every day. Until then, every day we ask, how is God wanting to be king in this life, in this day, in this choice, in this family? And somehow we are made new as we make that decision every day, even if it's a difficult decision. And so I wanted to take some time to reflect on that today. I wanted to ask two questions for us to, to bring before the Lord. How have we been making something else king? Maybe our work, our relationships, our possessions, the coronavirus, politics, the news, knowing the future, resolving difficulties, even justice. Caring about these things is not necessarily bad in itself, but it's a problem if they become our king. What else has been king in our lives? And to build on that, name a situation at the moment where it really doesn't feel like God is reigning. A situation in your personal life or in your family or the world. What feels very unlike the kingdom? to invite God right now. Our King who is good, we need His help even to discern this. We want to invite Him to help us see how it would look different if we really lived as if Jesus is King in that circumstance. Which doesn't mean it will necessarily be resolved in the way that we would imagine it. It may. But invite the Lord to help you see if you really believed and lived God as King in that circumstance which feels unlike the kingdom. What would change? As we prepare for communion, we also have a time of confession, and um, it's one that we often need. But I wondered today if it would be helpful to be able to confess ways that we have not been trusting God's reign. 
you don't have to go into all the details. He understands what you mean, but even in a, a word or a phrase. So we'll just have a moment of silence now as our, as our time of prayer, preparing our hearts for communion to confess the ways that we've let something else be keen. One more opportunity. There is no shame. God understands how hard it is for us, but he does welcome us. We can't enter his kingdom if we're not willing to say he is king. And every day we have an opportunity to do that over and again. And he welcomes us like the, the father of the prodigal son who runs with open arms and says, at last you're willing to receive my love again. So I'll leave a moment now. And if you feel led to confess that, do so privately and quietly if you'd like to, but it also blesses us. Something I believe something breaks through on a spiritual level when we are willing to speak aloud. Our own change of heart to bring ourselves and our hearts back to God once more. So if you uh, are able to bless us in that way, call it out loudly so we can hear it and be blessed. confess that I take on the weight of things that the God is that God is not asking me to take on and that I neglect to take on things that God is asking me to take on. Father, we confess that you are king, that you are the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, that you rule and reign in places we cannot see or understand, that you sustain our lives, that you keep our hearts beating, that you provide the rain that nourishes the earth, that provides the food for these bodies that you made, that you give us the thoughts the experiences that you walk with us. 
that you fill us, that you bring people into our lives to shape us and change us. We confess that we have not always acknowledged your will and reign in us. We know each person here what is on their heart. Receive their confession. Shake them to be more like the kingdom dweller today and every day. We thank you that you receive us. We thank you for the peace that Jesus invites us into. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you could get your communion supplies out, if you have them with you, it's a beautiful reminder that while Jesus' supper with his friends was very small and in a hidden room, he, I'm assuming, and was imagining the wedding feast that he knew was in store for us all. The feast in the kingdom where all, all would be welcome, where all would have enough. And so even as we take this strange little, probably slightly dead cracker today, and sip whatever drink we brought with us, we remember that tiny feast that they had, which was a reminder of the feast that is, that is ahead for us in the kingdom that already reigns. And so if you'll stand with me, we'll remember this together. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. Also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Christ was seized to the end of the earth. He shatters the bowman's fear. There is a river where streams will make life. The city of our most high. God is a river. She will not fail. Listen and hear the Lord say, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I we uh, continue in our worship, I will mention uh, the offering. Uh, we have a uh, bucket up here uh, after the service ends. If you have anything uh, to give, that would be a place for it. And continue the uh, online ACH if that is the most helpful. Um, as we, the things that we do with our bodies uh, uh, matter. The things the places that we spend our money it matters. And this is the way we play in the worship of Jesus and moving in that um, the other way of proclaiming um, our allegiance to him uh, before anything else. Um, and the other announcement that we have is tomorrow night uh, we will have uh, um, online prayer call. Susan Carson will be leading that. Um, if you, it's for healing prayer, uh, both emotional and uh, physical, and um, whatever you have to bring. But talk to Mandy and she'll give you a uh, link for that. Um, yeah, this. Uh, reign of the kingdom of God that we proclaim uh, is, we can only proclaim that and with hope because we believe in the king. Jesus is the king who was laid in the ground, who is dead, and uh, his disciples mourned, but uh, he was raised again. And because Jesus is alive, because we proclaim the, uh, the reign of the living king, that we can hope in this, that we believe that whatever life throws at us, whatever ways that we experience death and all the small ways that lead to, uh, to uh, us also resting in the ground. We trust and we hope in the kingdom of God that uh, never ends, in which we are always safe and secure. Um, would you close with us in our doxology? Praise God.